if you've read either part one or part two of Energy Media's Unethical Oil series, uh, you'll know that uh, regulatory capture is an issue in Alberta with respect to the oil and gas industry. Well, there are different types of capture, and one of them is the regulator. Another one is the culture, and I think it's fair to say that, I mean, polling data shows that Albertans identify with the oil and gas industry, but there's also political capture. And it, it's, I don't know that it's really disputed anymore that the oil and gas industry has an outsized influence on uh, energy and other policies within the province. But is the government, the current government of Premier Danielle Smith, using the power of the state to try to shield the oil, Alberta oil and gas industry from not only the global energy transition and changes that are coming to oil and gas, but also from federal climate policy. So I'm gonna to talk to Stuart Prest, who is now a lecturer at the University of British Columbia about this. Welcome to the interview, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. Well, look, I've, kind of, I've, I've set the stage here uh, about regulatory capture, political capture, What's your take on that? I think it's certainly the the case that we can see, uh, not not just limited to Alberta. We can we can see in in many jurisdictions uh, this kind of incidents where there is a a dominant industry, and that dominant industry has an outsized influence on uh, uh, on the politics of of that uh, of that political community. It's a uh, one way to think of it is. Uh, an outsized version of, of the company town, right, where there's one one major economic actor in town, and everyone sees their their economic interests attached to that that enterprise, even if they're not working directly for for that industry, their their livelihoods is some way uh, based on uh, on the the, the uh, fate of, of that industry. That's the perception. Whether you think about uh, uh, the, the mill towns, or whether you think about uh, towns built around uh, uh, a, ref a refinery, or, or or so on, we we have that. A community with with the investment of, of a single industry or fishing communities on on the east coast of Canada. It's actually a, a pretty common story. What is a little different here is that the, the size of the the entity uh, that that identifies so closely with the industry, an entire province, and rather than just a, a so it's a company province in that sense. Yes, and uh, you know, Canada is the world's fourth largest oil and gas producer, and I think Alberta sits at number eight globally. So, I mean, this is no small industry. It's a very, a very large, powerful uh, uh, part of the global oil and gas industry. But I want to run something past you, Stuart. I'm writing a column about the incumbency dilemma with respect to Alberta oil and gas. And that is when a, a, a business, uh, when, when a sector is disrupted by new technologies in this case, and, and also new policies and uh, the design to reduce uh, emissions, the the uh, it, the incumbent has a couple of options, and one of them would be the most obvious one would be to pivot to some sort of low carbon business model, and that doesn't seem to be happening here. In fact, we just saw Suncor's uh, CEO Rich Kruger uh, kind of reject that that approach a few weeks ago in the in the media. Uh, the problem, the second option that they have then is, and the one that the industry seems to have chosen, is to double down on the status quo. And it seems like then the the uh, the UCP government of Premier Smith is 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 moving in lockstep. They're coordinated almost with the the industry. Is that a fair way to look at this? Uh, yeah, I think they're they're it's it's pretty clear, not a, a particularly a, a secret that uh, really whoever is is in uh, office in, in Alberta politics, they are paying close attention to to what the oil industry s says. And in the case of, of Ms. Smith, is not just listening to the industry, but uh, but but really trying to to do whatever is possible to try to to support that that industry. It's we have even seen at times in Alberta his Alberta's uh, history where it seems like. It's not just a, a question of regulatory capture where, where government is doing the bidding of industry, but but the, the politicians seem more committed to the the, the industry of uh, of oil extraction than than the oil extractors themselves. So at times we've ever heard talk of of uh, diversification and moving towards different types of industries from from particular actors in the oil sector, but that's never really caught on with with uh, particularly the right of center governments in in Alberta and and Ms. Smith really fits in in that mold, really doing whatever possible to to protect the the status quo and and, and it's that sort of idea of protecting the um, 
the the goose that lays the golden egg or, or having a bird in hand and the, uh, some sort of sense that we need to do what we can to the the present for fear of what the future may bring the problem with that is the future is coming anyways whether whether you uh move to to embrace it and, and, and meet it or not uh we had just uh yesterday uh fatih barrel who is the executive director of the international energy agency wrote an op-ed in the financial times uh saying that new modeling from the iea suggests that oil demand global oil demand is going to peak uh, sometime this decade, probably between 2028 and, and 2030. And that means the, the future that we're talking about is the different future is going to arrive sooner rather than later. So what are the political consequences here? How is this likely to play out politically? Uh, you know, uh, is it might, is there a good chance that in fact, what, that the Smith government, the UCP will be reelected and that the the uh, government and the industry can go on trying to protect the status quo long after it's obvious that the industry is in decline and is and either needs to make a pivot or is a sunset industry and is going to you know ultimately fail. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That uh, at a certain point, someone is going to to make a decision to to change the direction of the the Alberta industry, and it can be uh, government looking for strategies to diversify and to try to to move towards a lower energy future. And and, and Alberta can certainly remain in uh, an energy producer, an energy superpower, if you want to use that kind of language. Uh, it doesn't just have to be oil. There are many different resources, renewable and otherwise, that that the, the province can can invest in, but. Whether the decision is taken by by the, the government of Alberta to engage in that process or by the the uh, industry actors themselves, at a certain point, if if when, once we reach peak demand, then prices will begin to drop uh, inexorably, and and they may they may pop back up from time to time. It's not a linear process, but but over time, the demand for oil globally will will decline, and, and prices will decline. These markets are connected in ways, and so even if it's not uh, an immediate customer of of Alberta. That that is uh, moving towards renewables. We know that the, the biggest consumers in the world, including mo notably China, a big piece of the story is that China is moving towards a renewable energy uh, uh, future faster than was anticipated, bringing on huge uh, resources online in terms of, of renewable energy production. And, and that's going to have an effect for the global energy, uh, energy market. And so it may be that the market makes that decision on behalf of Alberta just to move investment elsewhere. And, and then Alberta will be having to adapt, but without the benefit of a lucrative industry to fund a transition. And that's really, that, that's the danger Alberta finds itself in, is to be reacting after its best days are, are behind it and not a, having the resources of, uh, to, to fuel uh, ha -ha, a, a transition to a, a different kind of, uh, a different kind of economy. And it would likely in that situation have to go cap in hand to to the federal government looking for for support for that transition and that would be a really uncomfortable place for alberta to be well that's what the segue into my next question which is we've had we've had now for uh ever since the uh ucp government was elected in 2019 under uh, jason kenney we've had this very contentious relationship with the federal government uh with alberta being the aggressor more often than not and and if the time comes when Alberta has to reach out to to Ottawa to say, look, you know, we're now we're in trouble now and we, we need your help. Does the this, you know, history of fractious relations, does that cause a problem down the road? It certainly can. Uh, one of the fascinating things to watch is where does uh, for Mr. Polyev move his uh, his party with regard to environmental issues. It may be that he takes a similar line to uh, to uh, Ms. Smith in Alberta, really taking that that climate skeptical approach and waiting for forces elsewhere to force the, the government's hand and to be less proactive than than the, the Liberal government has been uh, and even uh, resistant to change. Uh, uh, and perhaps uh, Polyev uh, will be the next prime minister. Currently, that's where the poll stands and. and and so we may be in a place where Alberta has another four or five years where we're able to to maintain this this status quo, but but things will change once again. And again, if at a certain point Alberta will have to go to to the federal government for support if they are not proactive in in uh, moving in in a different environmental and, and uh, economic direction. And 
and uh, perhaps they'll have friends in in Ottawa at the time, but but there's a good chance that they they will not, and and this this current strategy will will make the the transition more difficult. But but even so, it will always be in Canada's interest to to support its provinces. It's one of the ironies of of federalism, and no matter how much the provinces kick and scream at, at different times, there there is always going to be an incentive for for the federal government once the province comes to looking for support to to provide some sort of support. And so Alberta, ironically, can continue to lean on the fact that it is part of this federation, even if it is a contentious partner at the moment. Does the the this fractious relationship with Alberta impede the creation of policy at the federal level to adapt to the energy transition? And I'm thinking, you know, investing in in new clean energy industry and promoting the adoption of uh, clean electricity, renewables, and maybe geothermal and and other sources of, of uh, power generation. Um, so is that a, is that a concern? Absolutely, the, the the federal government can has certain tools at its disposal. The, the 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 one new one, and this is going to be an important legacy of the the liberal government, is the the ability to set a price on carbon. That's a that's a federal power that didn't previously exist uh, without contention. Now it's clear that it does. So that's a a tool in the, the federal government's uh, arsenal, but it's a limited one. It doesn't control investment necessarily directly. Uh, it can 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 generate resources for investment, but. But beyond that, the, the federal government's other major tool here is is investment, is the, the power of the purse. But without wheeling partners to spend the money that the federal government is making available, that doesn't really amount to much. And so the, the federal government can can put together programs to try to, to engineer, to try to incentivize provinces to take that step. But with provinces uh, generally skeptical or, or not really focused on on and, and taking advantage of that, that that money is going to be of limited utility. And if, if the federal government feels like it's unlikely to to have willing partners, it may invest less energy uh, uh, than it would otherwise in, in putting together those programs. It will do things that are signaling politically that they're taking action, but w without the willing partners, the, the programs are much less likely to be well thought out, meaning the actual needs of the province. Alberta is not going to be willing partners in, in making programs that make sense for Alberta's situation. Uh, and and it, it, it amounts to uh, an, an opportunity for political posturing as opposed to partnership in, in building effective programming. And, and, and that's a loss for, for everyone, ultimately. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for your insights. Really appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure. Anytime.